Today, we are starting a new series. Are you ready for this? A new series that we call Miracles. And I'm really excited about this uh, because we want to learn a whole lot more. I think this, is gonna, um, this series is going to build our faith and raise our expectancy that we have a God who serves us with miracles to prove to us that he's for us. And so uh, we want to do this. And the reason why I think this is important to do this series is because I think so many of us, can we be honest? So many of us, we approach life or we perceive life quite rationally. It's all in our heads. And obviously that's Not bad, that's a good thing. God gave us our brains and our minds to try to understand and life and what's happening and find reasons. That's all good. But we've, I think many of us, especially those of us who are Germans, right, we, like, we always like very, like, there must be an explanation for everything, right? And if it can't be explained, it can't be real. <laughs> and that is, a, that is a problem because miracles, just by the very nature of it, miracles are things that can't really be explained. They're just a bit, they're supernatural. They're out of our brain capacity to grasp it. Uh, but we've become quite cynical almost um, about miracles because we just, we're just not sure what to do with it. Uh, that we say things like, yeah, keep dreaming, like sarcastically. When somebody says, oh, this is a miracle, like, yeah, keep dreaming. Or we say things like, oh, I'll eat my hat if that happens. Have you said that? Maybe it's a bit old-fashioned, but like some people might still say, for example, when my kids come to me and they say, dad, can we have a dog? not going to happen, right? <laughs> I'm going to say, keep dreaming. That would be a miracle. It's not going to happen. Or maybe you're saying, hey, Lewandowski just left to go to Barcelona. I'm a Hertha fan. This is going to be our year. And next year, Hertha is going to win the Bundesliga. We're going to win the championship. You know, I'll eat my hat if that happens. It's not going to happen. It would be a miracle. And I know it's not going to happen. Hertha is not going to win. Some of you are offended when I just said this. <laughs> Union, maybe, but Hertha is not going to win. Anyways, uh, now, <laughs> we want to look at miracles. And let me just kind of give you an overview of where we're going to go in this series and what you can expect. For the next five Sundays, we'll look at five different types of miracles. Miracles of healing, miracles of provision, miracles of protection, miracles of reconciliation among each other, And then also, and that's the one we're going to look at today, miracles of deliverance. Deliverance. And maybe you're going, what is this deliverance thing? Is that Uber Eats? Is that HelloFresh? Like, what, what is going to be delivered to my house now? It is actually, this topic is much darker than this, much creepier, much harder to conceive. What I want to talk to you today about as we kick off this series is uh, how God sets us free, delivers us from evil. One of the requests we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer is, deliver us from evil, right? What do we actually pray for when we, when we say that line, deliver us from evil? Um, now, the Bible is very clear that there is a visible world, and then there's also an invisible world, something we can't see and even sense with any of our five senses. There's an invisible world, like a parallel universe. It talks about the, being the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness, there's principalities, there's rulers of darkness, there's evil forces, spiritual forces. In the Bible, there are over 100 references uh, to demons. Demons, right? And it's like, oh my goodness, like, Dave, did you watch too many fantasy movies? Like, what's happening today? They were weird today. <laughs> Jesus was casting out demons, actually. We read these stories, actually. Uh, today, what we want to do is look at maybe the creepiest or the, the most haunting, the most graphic, the most terrifying of all the stories where Jesus was casting out demons. A demon. But before we read that story, it's in Mark chapter 5, if you want to already go there in your Bibles. Uh, but before we do that, let me actually explain to you first, what is a demon? Because we have all kinds of weird concepts about this, because maybe you're thinking now of a haunted house. It's like, ooh, you know what's happening there? Or maybe you have this understanding that when somebody dies, if they were a good person, they're going to become an angel. If they were a bad person, they're going to become a demon. And when you think of demon, you think of your uncle who passed away. And you're like, yeah, yeah, he was a bad guy. He's a demon now, you know? And, and maybe that's your understanding. Well, what does the Bible say when it uses the word demons? It actually says that demons are fallen angels. 
fallen angels. Uh, there's not, we need to understand the Bible is a book primarily, this tells the story of God and us. It doesn't tell the story of God and the angels and the demons. So there's not that much actually in there. So we need to kind of try to put things together from what we do read. But if you want to be at home, you can read Isaiah chapter 14 or Revelation, last book of the Bible, verse ch uh, chapter 12. That's kind of where it tells a story of what happens in the unseen world and the kind of the history of that. Let me just kind of summarize it for you. There was an angel, his name was Lucifer, and he wanted to overthrow God in heaven. He wanted to have the heavenly throne for himself. He was unsuccessful, and as a result, as a punishment, God kind of cast him out from heaven. That's why at some point Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Maybe you've heard this quote. Um, and so when, when Satan, when Lucifer, when same guy, when they were cast out from heaven, uh, whole divisions of angels who were kind of on Satan's side were cast out with him. About one third of all the angels left heaven and they are now what we call demons, these fallen angels who are ruled, who are governed by Lucifer slash Satan. I know, right? It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful already. It's hard to believe because you're thinking like, oh my goodness, I just walked down Berlin and now where am I? What is Dave talking about? This is the 21st century. Are you, do you really believe this? Right? It's a weird topic today. Some of you, if this is your first time, you chose a great Sunday to come to church. But we want to go there today because I think it's really important to talk about these things. C.S. Lewis, some of you have heard of this guy. He was an author um, from, from the British Isles. He, um, he once said that we Christians tend to make one or two mistakes when it comes to this, the dark forces, to, to demons. We make one or two mistakes. Uh, he says, either we disbelieve their existence... We say, that nah, can't be. How primitive, how un uneducated. I can't believe in that stuff. Or we do believe in their existence, but we also develop an excessive, a very unhealthy interest, a fascination in these things. Maybe that's you. And you're sitting in church today and like, finally, Dave's talking about demons. I've been waiting for this Sunday for years. Finally, we're going to talk about my favorite subject of the unseen world. Right? And others of you are thinking, why did I come to church today? Dave lost it. Dave is getting weird. What's happening? Well, let me tell you, there is no need to be weird when we talk about this subject. There's also no need to be afraid when we talk about this subject. What I want to do today is be real about it. Okay? I believe the greatest trick that the enemy has ever pulled is to make us think he doesn't exist. Let me say that again. The greatest trick the enemy has ever pulled is he convinced us that he doesn't exist. And that's why he has freedom to just move about because we don't even think he's there. Okay? So today I want to help you see that spiritual forces, they are real, they are crafty, and they are defeatable. They are real, they are crafty, and they are also defeatable. Let me tell you, if you deny, ignore, or forget any of those three, that spiritual forces are real, crafty, and defeatable, if you forget that or deny that, you've already lost. It will, it will beat you, okay? You need to, if you, in order for you to face your enemy, you need to understand your enemy. And so I believe this story in Mark chapter 5 can help us with this. Are you ready? One of you is. <laughs> the rest of you, are you ready? Kind of, I know it's a weird Sunday. Let's just go there, see what God has for us, okay? Mark chapter 5, it's also on your piece of paper and your contact card or here on the screen. Let me just read it to you. They, that's Jesus and his disciples, they were on a boat and they arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. That's in the southeast end of the lake of Gennesaret. And when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit, by a demon, he came out from the tombs to meet him. Now remember, they weren't burying the dead like we do in the ground. They actually had caves and tombs where they were putting the dead and they put a rock in, like, like Jesus was buried, right? And so it could be that there were some of the caves where they had the little sanctuary. Some of the caves were empty, and that's where this guy's 
this guy had his home. And so he came out from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Now, read these next verses. Look at how this man was just tortured from the inside, day and night. This is haunting. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to him, and bowed low before him with a shriek. He, the demon inside him now, screamed out through the voice of the man, screamed out, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the demon, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name, our name, our name is Legion, because there are many of us inside of this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. And then it says, so Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs. I told you, this is a weird story. 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned into the water. Here's where we get that joke. Here's where we get the term swine flu from. <laughs> okay, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right? I know, right? Okay. All right. So the swine flew and they drowned <laughs> in the water. Oh. The herdsmen who were caring for the, for the pigs, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and then they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. What's happening? He's sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Why were they afraid? Because they knew the condition of this man. They tried to kind of put him in chains even because he was a pain to the whole community. And now they saw him calm, no longer wild. They saw him sitting, not screaming. They saw him clothed, not naked anymore. And they looked at Jesus and they were scared. They were like, who are you? Who are you that you were suddenly able to free him from this? And then in verse 20, it just says, but the man who had been delivered from the demons, he started off to visit the 10 towns of that region, the 10 different cities, and he began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed at what he told them. Guys, what a story, isn't it? This is the word of God for us today. What a crazy story. What I want to do today is show you from this story a little bit how demons work in our lives, and then also show you, because I think we need to know this, but also show you The, the remedy, how Jesus delivers us from them, how Jesus delivers us from evil. Are you in? Okay, cool. Um, so obviously we see here in this guy a very graphic, very extreme description of somebody who has come under the influence of a demonic force, of dark forces. Uh, to be honest, I've never seen anything this extreme in my life. I haven't. Maybe some of you have. I haven't. Um, but what I have seen actually in my life and also in the lives of those around me, in some of your lives as well, that sometimes the enemy, the dark forces, they come and they try to attack us. They try to influence us and they attack our lives. And so what I want to do right now is show you just five things I believe everyone should know about demons. Five things everyone should know about demons that you can write down. And maybe you're saying, I'm not going to write this down. Dave, why are you bringing this to me? I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Therefore, I don't have to fear the demons because the Holy Spirit has made, has made up residence inside of me. They won't be able to get in. And you are right, 100%. 100%. You can't have the evil spirits and the Holy Spirit in your heart. The Holy Spirit, you know, keeps the door closed. At the same time, you must know that they knock. 
And they do try to get in. And you may not be possessed by an evil spirit, but you can still be attacked by an evil spirit. So don't think you are immune, but just be alert. Don't be scared, but be alert. Here's what demons try to do in your life, okay? So write these down. The first thing is, so five things everyone should know about demons. The first thing is, they confuse you with lies. They confuse you with lies. They always try to distract you from God's will. They're trying to constantly distort the truth so that you start believing lies about yourself, about the people that you have a relationship with, um, about the world, lies about God. Constantly you're being bombarded with lies from the dark forces, okay? Now, Jesus says the devil, he's actually the father of lies. What does that mean? That means he's very good at it, okay? He's crafty. He's wily, is that a word? Yeah. He's, he's, he's really, like, he's, he's sneaky. He's perfected the art of lying for thousands of years. And so when he comes up to me to lie to me, he doesn't come, maybe you've noticed this as well, when he comes to you, he doesn't come with obvious lies where you right away know, like, oh, that's a lie, I won't believe it. He comes with half-truths that sound about right, that sound reasonable, and you start to believe it. For example, the enemy doesn't come to me with a straight-up lie. He doesn't come to me and says, Dave, God is so disappointed with you. He doesn't like you anymore because you are an anorexic. When he would say that to me, I would say, it's not true. It's a lie. Obviously, it's not true. So what does the enemy say? He comes with a half-truth. He says, Dave, you're not disciplined. Not at all. Look at yourself. Whenever you're at ho alone at home, you open the drawer and you have hidden chocolate in your desk. And you snack when you're alone. You should pray when you're alone, but no, you're not that kind of pastor. You eat junk food when you're alone and everybody sees it and everybody's talking about it. God and the angels are also shaking their heads and they're, they're looking at you. It's like, how can we ever use this guy? Why is he the pastor of this church? How do we get rid of him? He's not disciplined enough. Look at him. What a pathetic guy. And God can no longer use you. And you see, the first part of that lie is actually a truth. I do have chocolate in my drawer. Don't you? Is Jenny here? She is, isn't she? Oh, she's, okay. She's not. T don't tell her, okay? Se second drawer. Just don't tell her not to. <laughs> right? There's truth to it, but the second part of that statement, therefore God cannot use you, that is a lie. And the, the truth is, God using me never depended on any of my weaknesses, right? The enemy will come and he will try to play with whatever your area of weakness is. And he will try to convince you your, your weakness makes you worthless. Therefore, God must be so upset with you. Listen to me. Only Jesus gets to define who you are. Only Jesus. The enemy tries to come, point out your weakness, make you feel worthless. The enemy tries to come and look at your wounds, point out your wounds like... Here's where you've messed up. And you start to believe those lies he tells you. Jesus doesn't do that. When Jesus comes to you, he doesn't point at your wounds. He shows you his wounds. And he says, look, here are my wounds. By these wounds, you are healed. Right? And just listen, you are not your worst moment in your life. Do you know that? Some of you are living under that lie that your worst moment in life, that's your identity. You are not your divorce. You are not your bankruptcy. You are not your abuse. You are not your abortion. You are not your addiction. You are not your affair. You know this. And maybe you're saying, yeah, sounds right. And you're saying it very loud, Dave. But still, if I'm honest, this was the biggest moment that ever happened in my life. This is the, greatest, the craziest thing that ever happened in my life. Of course, that defines me most. And I say, no, even that is a lie. The greatest, craziest thing that ever happened in your life is that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he rose from the dead to give you a new life. That is the biggest thing that ever happened in your life. And don't you ever let anybody tell you and distract you and confuse you with a lie that tells you otherwise. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, he tries, they try to confuse you 
with lies. The second thing is demons tempt you to sin. They tempt you all the time. They tempt you to sin. Maybe after a long day at work or maybe after a long day serving in the church. It's like, okay, now you deserve it. God is not looking. He's so happy with you right now. He's celebrating everything that happened in church today. He's not looking. Just go take this. Smoke this. Watch this. Consume this. Touch this. You won't get caught. It's not a big deal. Everybody's doing it. You're missing out if you don't. You know those? I do. All the time, it's like, oh, it's not a big deal, not, not a big deal. And so the, the demons, they try to present the bait to you while hiding the hook. They try to serve you the drink while hiding the poison. Actually, the oldest trick in the book, literally the oldest trick in the book from the first few chapters of the Bible, the enemy is still using that lie to try to, or that, that trick to, to get to us is when... When they come to you, the dark forces, they come to you and they whisper, did God really say? You know that one? Did God really say this or did God really say that? And what they try to do is they try to make us question God's ways and God's will and God's word for our lives. They try to make us question this. Did God really say that you have to be generous with your money? Did it really mean that? Or was that just for the people at the time? Did God really say you should care for creation? Ah, did God really say that sex is for marriage? Did he really mean that? Or was that just for people at that time? Did God really say you have to forgive those who hurt you? He didn't know how much you were hurt. Like, did God really say? That's what the enemy tries to do. He's always trying to confuse us, trying to, yeah, trying to... to to make us live our lives outside of the will of God. Just be aware of that. The third thing is demons make you lose control. The demons, they try to make you lose control. This story, I think, is, is very interesting. On the one hand, this guy seems like he was super empowered, literally super <laughs> he was Superman, apparently. He was so strong that they couldn't even bind him. It says no, no one was strong enough to subdue him. He, was, he, he received so much power, it seems, from the dark forces. At the same time, he was enslaved to the dark forces. It seems like both at the same time. He was empowered and enslaved at the same time. He was, point, he was haunted by the voices in his head. He, um, he was out of control. He was mastered by those demons. Have you also noticed in, in uh, I think, verse 3 it was, where it talks about that no one was strong enough, uh, it says the man could no longer be restrained. That word, no longer, actually uh, caught my attention because that means at some point it was still possible to restrain him and then it got worse and worse and worse. You know what that means? Evil is gradual. E evil is... is I know it's dark today, guys. It gets better, I promise. But right now, it's like, let's talk about it. Evil is gradual. It's just, it doesn't just happen, bam, and now you're possessed. Like, no, it sneaks up on you slowly, maybe over, over decades, right? And, and, and then more and more, you kind of, it's like a downward spiral. It's like, oh, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Um, these demons, they can sneak up in your life. And you don't even notice it because they play with your need for empowerment, so that you feel good about yourself. And they give you a little bit to take a whole lot more. So it's like, here is some power. Here is some prestige. Here are some possessions. Here is a position. Here is some pleasure. Right? They give you all these things, and you're like, oh, hello, thank you very much. That feels good. And you, don't, you, you take the bait, but you don't see the hook. Right? And then you feel empowered for a season and after a while you realize, now I'm enslaved to these things. I am obsessed with power. I'm, I'm obsessed with my success, with my salary, with, with whatever, with, with sex, with, with my image, with all of these things, with, with shopping maybe. Yeah? I'm, I'm obsessed with these things. I'm enslaved by these because you took the bait and now you're hooked. And you're wondering, how did I get here? How did that happen? The answer is gradually. Slowly it happened, and now you're out of control, or you've lost your control. Right? The fourth thing, and then it gets better, the fourth thing is demons, they attack you with pain. 
Demons attack you with pain. Demons can hurt you. They can confuse you. They can cause division. They can cause heartache. Okay, and this guy here, we can see he was he was haunted. He was running around the hills, screaming, howling, shrieking, cutting himself. Right? He was obviously in so much pain. Why? Well, Jesus says in John chapter 10 that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The very opposite of what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to bring life and save and restore. He comes to, for destruction, right? And uh, maybe you want to write this down. Whatever the enemy fears most about me, he will attack the most. Let me say that again. Whatever the enemy fears most about me, he will attack the most. If your marriage is being attacked, it's because the enemy is scared of your marriage, of the potential that is there. If your children are attacked, if your finances are attacked, if your health is attacked, if your mental health is attacked, the, the enemy is scared of these things. This is not a game I'm talking about right now. The enemy will try to come, the demons, they will try to come and inflict pain. They will influence your mind, maybe even give you thoughts of suicide. They will try to destroy your marriage. They will try to ruin your testimony. They will try to rob your joy. They will try to confuse and, and make you question your faith. They will try to wreck your finances. They will try to crush your children. Guys, this stuff is real, okay? I know we hardly ever talk about this, and this is a bit of a All off Sunday for us, but we need to be aware and alert that this is happening in our lives. The demons in your life and my life, these dark forces, they have just but one mission, is to attack and destroy whatever matters most to God. They can't get to him because that, that didn't happen. So they try to attack the thing that he cares about most. And there's nothing that matters more to God than you. You know this? Nothing matters more to God than you. That's why you feel those attacks. Now, I know these first four points, they were dark. They were terrifying. Let me give you now this fifth one, and it's the massive game changer that actually make these four first ones look very weak suddenly. Number five, demons, they bow to Jesus. They bow to Jesus. Somebody said, amen. I was hoping for a bigger one. So let me just say it again. Number five, the demons, they bow to Jesus. Yes. <laughs> okay. It is true. Remember in this story, this guy, he was out of control. He couldn't be chained. The people were scared of him. And when Jesus shows up, this man, he ran to him, but not with rage, like he would be running to everybody else. He ran to him with reverence and he fell down. The demons inside him made him fall down at the feet of Jesus. You see how important that is. That which nobody was able to do, no chain, no effort, all of the attempts of the people in that community, they were not successful. And Jesus just shows up in his very presence, makes this guy fall down and surrender. Right? He was out of control and suddenly, poof. you see how huge that is. And then what we see next is this powerful miracle of deliverance, how this man, this poor man, who was absolutely helpless, comes face to face with Jesus, who is absolutely wonderful, and this man is healed. This man is set free. We read here that this guy was not just possessed by one dark force and one demon, but he was actually possessed by a whole legion which means the Romans at the time, when they had legions, there were thousands of individual soldiers who made up a unit of one legion, okay? We know later on there's 2,000 pigs, so if it's possible, there's about 2,000 demons inside this one man. That just tells you how many of them actually might be around if Satan can spare 2,000 of them just to haunt one guy. All right, it's just a bit scary. But here on the one side, we see an army of dark forces Versus on the other side, one Jesus, just Jesus, and still it's no contest. There's no match, not at all. These army of dark forces, they don't even try to go into battle with Jesus. They don't even try to start or launch an attack. They flat out surrender. There's no way we have a chance. It's the prince. It's the son of God. They know who he is, right? They saw 
he saw them falling down from heaven like lightning. And so they just fall flat on their face. They surrender. It's like, we give up. We give up. You're the Lord. You're the Lord. You're the son of the most high. And they actually confess who he is. It's quite remarkable. You know why that is? They knew light always wins in the darkness. Write that one down. I know it's a simple statement, but light always wins in the darkness. Even if it's a dark room and you have the window, everything dark, blacked out, you put up one little candle, that light wins in the darkness. Darkness is not the opposite of light, it's the absence of light. And then when light shows up, boom, light wins, always in the darkness. In John chapter 1, verse 5, it says about Jesus that he, the light, he shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish the light. It's impossible. Light always wins. So Jesus, he is the light of the world and the rulers of darkness are no match for his light. Now, as we read on, these, <laughs> these demons here, it's, it gets a bit weird. They are pleading with Jesus not to be sent away from the land. They say, don't send us into a distant land. We like this area. We like the people here. Like, what is that about? And so, interestingly enough, they come to an agreement with Jesus that they were allowed It says Jesus gave them permission to enter into the pigs. Now, the Bible commentators, when they hear that, they just go crazy on, oh, what does that mean? And we don't know what that means. And there's all kinds of theories of what that means because pigs, to the Jewish people, they were unclean. So maybe those were pagan uh, shepherds who were uh, taking care of them. And maybe, obviously, obviously, they were somebody's revenue and maybe somebody was punished by this. And there's all kinds of theories of what that means. And I'm so glad you came to this church because I'm going to give you the truth right now. Because uh, I have divine insight. The truth is, I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay. We actually, we have no idea really what that means with how, like we only have like, if, if that, we have like 1% of knowledge to understand kind of in the unseen world how these dark forces might relate to a person's body or an animal or the land or the water and drowning. Are they dead? Like what happened to them? It's, it's like we don't even understand 1% of this. Okay, it's, it's all a bit confusing. But here's what we do know. The man was set free, right? He experienced a miracle of deliverance. And the other thing is that we know, listen guys, Jesus has the power and the authority and the command over demons and darkness. That's what we can see here. And here's the thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you belong to him, if you are in Christ, you also have been given as an inheritance authority and command over the forces of darkness. Did you know that? That you also, because you belong to him, you also have been given authority. There are several verses in the Bible. Let me just show you one of them, where Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, he calls his disciples, that's us, his followers, here's what he gave them authority for. He gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease. Guys, that is your inheritance as well. That's the authority that God gives to you. And you're wondering, yeah, but what does that mean? Let me try to explain it in a very maybe silly example. Imagine if I were a policeman, <laughs> okay? I always wanted to be a cop. But if I were a traffic policeman and I would be standing outside of the street and I would try to uh, stop a delivery van, okay? Do I personally, physically have the power to make that van stop. I know I'm a big guy, but still, no, I don't have the power to make a delivery truck, a delivery van stop. If he wants to, he can just run over me, right? I don't have the power to stop him, but I have, if I'm a policeman, it says police here, I have the authority to stop him. And if he does not respect that authority, I know there is a higher power See where I'm going with this? There is a higher power to which he must respond to, to which he must answer to if he doesn't respect my authority. So I very much can stop him, even though physically I don't have the power. What does that mean? We don't, in our own strength, we don't have what it takes to face the, the forces of darkness in our lives. We're just not strong enough. But we have been given authority 
to call upon the name that is above every other name. And we say, in the name of Jesus, just like the policeman says, in the name of the law, in the name of Jesus, stop. And they better respond to what we say. We have been given authority and command. And I know it all sounds a bit wild today. So let me just, as we wrap this up, get very practical with this. What does this mean for tomorrow morning, for Monday, for this next week? How does this play itself out? Because most of us, we live quite busy lives and we're just trying to get through the week and uh, we may be quite oblivious. We may be quite unaware of the dark forces in our lives and how they try to influence us, how they try to influence our moods and our minds and our movements, how there are demons in your life, in my life, that try to um, attack your marriage, they try to attack your children, they're trying to get you um, yeah, connected to some kind of chemical or a kick or a lustful image or something just to get you through the day. And we're just so unaware of this. So how do we deal with this now after this Sunday? It's like we've heard a few things about demons in church. What do we do with this? First of all, maybe you want to write this down. The first thing is, remember, not every problem is caused by spiritual forces. Please remember that. Not every problem is caused by spiritual forces. You don't have to look for the demon behind, uh, under any rock, under every rock, okay? So, for example, if you are a millennial or younger, let me just offend you, uh, and your boss who is older than you has constructive feedback to give to you and you just don't like feedback, okay? It's like, I don't know what to do with this. Don't go it's like, ooh, I'm being attacked by my boss. It's a spiritual attack. Me, 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 me. No, you're just not very good with criticism, okay? You're not very good with feedback. Or if you, like me, you struggle to lose weight, Don't say, yeah, yeah, the demon made me eat the entire pizza. No, you just have no self-control and you ate the entire pizza. Okay, so don't look for a demon under every rock. But at the same time, while not every problem is caused by spiritual forces, also know some problems might be. Some problems might be. And just be aware to the eventuality that it could be. And so you never know. They do tend to hide really well. They do tend to hide really well. So I want to encourage you very practically. Anytime you face some kind of problem or a challenge or a mountain or a temptation or something comes up in your life, just yeah, treat it as if, it could, as if as maybe there's somebody behind, this, behind the scenes kind of pulling strings, okay? So what I would encourage you to do is respond to it with what's logic, with what's wise, with what's natural, what's reasonable. Have your own response to it and don't just like, oh, Jesus has to handle this, okay? At the same time, at the same time, pray for a supernatural inter intervention and for deliverance by a wonder-working God because you never know because you might be. So we, we just don't have the insight to see like Jesus has, oh, this is definitely a demonic thing or this, this one isn't, okay? So just, just deal with the eventuality. For example, my wife Jenny, um, some of you know this, she has some chronic illnesses, that we're trying to deal with and she goes to see a specialist uh, and there's treatment and we go through that. That is the logical thing to do. That is wise to do. That is a reasonable thing to do. At the same time, don't you doubt that we also are aware that this might be an attack on her body from some kind of dark force. And so we pray. Over, we pray out the name of Jesus over any darkness that may try to cover, to touch her body. It's like, no way, stop in the name of Jesus. Because if it isn't, we have the specialist, but if it is, we better pray as well. Does that make sense? So for you, I don't know what that means for you. Just some examples here that maybe I can think of if I have it. If I have it, I have it somewhere. Yes. So, <laughs> because I wrote them down. Because maybe, maybe you are battling with some kind of, maybe mental health stuff, maybe battling with anxiety or depression, please, please go see a psychologist. There's no shame in going to see a psychologist. This is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength when you have the courage. It's like, I'm gonna, I need help here. That's a strong statement for you to take. And if there's some prescription and some pill and you feel okay with taking it, please, that's a logical, a reasonable thing to do. At the same time, Let's pray, and I'm happy to pray with you, that there, if there's any kind of dark cloud over your life that is actually coming from the pit of hell, let's pray that God would clear the sky so you can see the sun again, okay? 
if there's stuff that happened in your life, maybe you are grieving a loss. Maybe someone passed away or someone left you and you're just grieving and you feel so sad. I would encourage you, go see a counselor maybe. If you're still dealing with stuff that happened years and years ago, go see a counselor, get some help, someone who can help, help you process these things. At the same time, let's pray that the enemy would not get a foot in the door by believing you all these lies that you started to believe about yourself. Well, here's why this didn't work out, this relationship that maybe you're grieving, okay? Maybe um, you're struggling with an addiction or maybe someone that you know is struggling with alcohol. Get them into therapy. Go, these programs are great. They can really help. At the same time, let's pray for spiritual victory over these things that you would be free from these chains. Yeah? Maybe uh, you have a rebelling child in your home, a teenager maybe, <laughs> like I do in my home. Okay? Take their phone away. That's a logical, a reasonable thing to do. They will live. It's no problem. Take the phone away. Monitor their friends a little bit. That's, that's a good thing to do. At the same time, pray for divine spiritual covering against any attack on your children. You see where I'm going with this? If there's maybe issues in your small group, maybe you have arguments in your small group. I'm not talking about any particular small group. Maybe you're thinking about which small group is in trouble now that Dave even preaches about. I'm just saying, sometimes when we're in close relationships, we get into each other's hairs and we like have problems. And, uh, you know, like... Do the reasonable thing. Communicate with each other. Get a mediator in the room if it needs to be, like just to sort things out. At the same time, pray for spiritual unity because you know that where brothers come together in unity, the enemy tries to attack us. Yeah? Okay, so th that's what I'm seeing. Do the logical thing and just pray because there's an eventuality that there might be a dark force, a demon behind it trying to attack you. Does it make sense? A little bit? Okay. Now... What you can say to claim authority, you can even speak it out. It's as simple as that to say, I take authority in the name of Jesus over this darkness. And he that is in me is greater than the dark forces that rule in this world. And he that is in me, he has overcome. And let me just share this and then we close because this is really important. What we see in this story here is this man who was possessed by these legions of demons, is he, it's quite a graphic description that he was naked, he was bleeding, he was crying out, living in the tombs. That's Mark chapter 5. If you fast forward to the end of the gospel of Mark, you can see that Jesus actually took that man's place. Jesus on the cross, crying out, bleeding out, weeping, yeah, naked, and then driven into the tombs. And that's, guys, that's where Jesus dealt with all evil. That's how Jesus won the victory. That's where Jesus has overcome all of our sin, all of the evil in our lives, all of the injustice in our lives, even death itself. Jesus has overcome. And the good news is, listen, his victory is our victory. If you're a follower of Jesus, his victory is our victory. And that means when the attack come into your life, last thing I want you to write down, when the attacks come into your life, <laughs> um, you don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. I know you were distracted just now, but let me say this again because this is really important. When the attacks come in your life, because Jesus has already overcome, you don't fight for victory. You fight with victory in your back. The victory is already won. So yes, be aware of the enemy and his demons and the attacks. They are real and they are crafty and all of that. And they are, yeah, but you must not fear them because victory is already yours. Uh, last verse I want to read to you in Romans chapter 8. It says, despite... All of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Nothing can ever separate us from God's, life, uh, God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, not even the powers of hell, they can ever separate us from God's love. Amen? So as we close, as we pray, I just want to say, maybe you feel right now, as you listen to all of this, maybe, maybe you're quite aware of these things. Maybe this is the first time you heard about this. But maybe you feel right now that the enemy has messed up your life. 
Maybe your relationships, maybe your emotions, your mind, maybe your finances, your health, whatever it is. You feel like, oh my goodness, what if this is the enemy? That's why everything is a mess. Maybe you feel like you have been besieged with lies. Maybe you feel like you have been caused by him to sin. Maybe you feel like he prompted you to be hurtful to others through gossip or through whatever it is. Like, where is that coming from? I'm not normally like this. Maybe you feel like he set you up for failure in your workplace or in your marriage or in your relationships or whatever. He set you up for failure. This story of deliverance is a miracle of deliverance of a guy who was messed up and then he was a messenger of hope to his people later. This should give us hope, guys. This should make us confident. This should raise our faith and our expectancy because we worship a God who rules and he reigns and he commands over all the forces of darkness. And this God, this victorious Jesus, we heard about this. He loves you. He's for you. And nothing, nothing can ever separate you from his love. So let me pray for you. Pray for us uh, for freedom and for victory. And then we're going to sing. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you well, for this story because it touches on a subject that we don't even like to think about because it is, it is a bit eerie and a bit, uh, well, haunting and chilling. And at the same time, if we're honest, we can tell that sometimes in our lives, there seems to be something happening that there's no possible explanation for it as if there's some dark things happening, some dark kind of attacks and getting into our lives and trying to mess us up and our families maybe or whatever the area, Lord. And we can, we can sense that that is here. And somebody maybe even sitting here right now is like, yeah, obviously I can point out all kinds of things right now after this message of where the enemy actually has messed things up in my life. Lord, I want to pray. I want to remind you that you have not lost any of your miracle power. And just like you ruled over these legions of demons in this man's life, you also rule today over anything that tries to influence us and overpower us. We cling to you, the great victor, the great overcomer who loves us and nothing can ever separate us. Help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on your truth and not believe the lies that the enemy tries to tell us. Help us, Lord, to not be distracted. Help us, Lord, to not be overpowered and lose control. Help us, Lord, protect us, shield us from the attacks of the enemy who tries to make us suffer and, and experience pain. Well, we, we know we don't have to fear these things because you're for us. But sometimes these things still feel real and we're kind of living our lives in this, in this sort of in-between time and it's sometimes just a bit strange. But Lord, we pray right now that you would come and encourage us and free us, set us free, Lord. We pray this prayer from the Lord's prayer. Deliver us from evil. In Jesus' name, amen.